Dude, you alive? Does your team need to master AngularJS? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to ours, angularbootcamp.com. This episode is sponsored by Widgmo 5, a brand new generation of JavaScript controls. A pretty amazing line of HTML5 and JavaScript products for enterprise application development in that Widgmo 5 leverages ECMAScript 5 and each control ships with AngularJS directives. Check out the faster, lighter, and more mobile Widgmo 5. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 30 of the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel we have Joe Eames. Hey everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week we have two special guests. We have the Angular interns. We have Roderick. Hey there. And Anting. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves really quickly? Sure. Well, personally, I was, I've was i been a contributor for a while for Angular, and last summer I got to go to, for an internship with a team in Mountain View. It was an interesting experience, and I guess we'll talk about that today. And I just worked on used Angular for my first internship, so for my second internship, I figured I'd try the Angular team, and I mostly worked on Angular Dart instead of Angular JS. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I have to say that on the sitcoms, the interns are always the easy comic relief. Is that, <laughs> is that what you do, or is there something else that you do there? Personally, uh, while I was an intern, I worked just like any other team member because I was, I was used to the project and I was contributing with on GitHub and everything. So awesome. it didn't feel much of a difference. Yeah, awesome. I would say it's about the same. So what sorts of contributions did you make while you were an intern? At the beginning, I was just uh, continuing to work on GitHub with issues. I mean, we had over a thousand issues open, including pull requests, so helped in managing that. And then I branched off, worked a bit on Tracer and like for ECMAScript 6 for stuff that the team wanted. And yeah, just helped around with any tasks that I had picked up. I didn't have a specific project set for me. And for me, the first half I was working on rewriting the dependency injection portion of Angular Dart. And then after the rewrite, which was mostly just for performance, I switched to like the Dart version of Tracer, I suppose, and doing other random things that the team wanted. The Dart version of Tracer? Isn't Tracer an ES6 thingy? Yeah, it, it like, well, it compiles Dart into Tracer. It was kind of oh, an experiment okay. to see if it was doable. Huh. So, so for our current browsers, you transpile Dart into Tracer and then Tracer into ES5? Uh, yes, except it was mostly for maintaining two libraries, like the watch, uh, the change detection library for Angular JS and Angular Dart, so they wouldn't have to maintain both of them since the code was, had like no dependencies and was basically exactly the same. Gotcha. Hmm. So, I don't know, Anthony, if you followed the project, the Angular, after internship, how close you followed it? But so initially we wanted we wanted to have one source one code base and use it for JavaScript and Dart, and so Antic worked on a thing for part of his internship on a thing to convert Dart to ECMAScript six, and then convert that to ECMAScript five. But I think now with AdScript we want to convert AdScript to Dart. Uh, round think they, and round and round it goes. <laughs> I think it was mostly like an experiment. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you going to be able to do one of those like Google Translate things where you take your at script, translate it to Dart, translate it back to ES6, and then maybe translate it back to at script again and go around a few times and see what comes out? <laughs> that sounds like a terrible, awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> Though I think if you do that, everything would still work. Probably. Yeah, probably. Solid software with tests. It doesn't really have the uh, comic capability that Google Translate does. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I, I'm kind of wondering, let's say that I'm a big fan of Angular and I'm in a position to do an internship. How do you line that up? How do you get to be an intern for the Angular JS awesomeness? Um, I think Roddy and I had pretty different experiences. I just applied normally through the Google internship program. And then when I got host matched with a bunch of different teams, I picked the Angular team. Gotcha. Yeah, so, so usually when you want to do a Google internship, uh, you have to do technical interviews. And then once you pass that gender in a project matching phase, then you get to match with one of the projects that interests you. And as long as the, the project managers are interested in you as well, 
But for my case, since I was contributing to Angular before, what actually happened is that at last, the last ng-conf, I'd met the team in person. They knew, knew me by my name, by my pull request, and so on. We talked, and then they told me, do you want to come as an intern? So it was more of an in-person thing. And then they put me in contact with HR. I passed the interviews, and then I already had done my project matching phase in a way. And so I, I got matched to Angular straight away. But you still need to pass through the whole Google stuff because as an intern, you, I mean, you have a Google badge, you're working at Google, Google Spain. Very nice. And I'm sure if, if someone is interested and wants to come as an, as an intern, the best way I find is to get recognized with pull request and helping out with issues and so on. And that's a very easy way than sending an email to Igor or, or Brad telling him, Hey, I'm interested in an internship. I'm studying. So I'm qualified for an internship. So can we start the process? Hmm. Sounds good. I'm going to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to be a student and stuff. So it graduate works as well. If I uh, quit my job and like watch some Coursera courses, does that count? <laughs> I believe Google requires you to have. A, I, I remember I had to send them a proof from my college that I'm mm. actually a student. Yeah, I learned from like a movie that you have to like go enroll in like Dubai or something, and then apply for a Google internship. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm going to start my own university. Sure, that that could work. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> University of Chuck. That doesn't have to be accredited or anything, right? So, did you guys work on site in um, Mount Mountain View? Yep. Yeah. So you need to be next to your supervisor. Mm-hmm. So because every week you have meet one on ones with him and so on or her. So uh, yes, you need to be in Mountain View. Awesome. Were you guys from the Bay Area, or did you go there for the internship? I go to school in Berkeley, so I'm pretty familiar here, but I think Roddy came pretty far. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Montreal, Canada, so I had to travel there. And Google pretty much gives you, uh, covers the costs, so it runs well. That's nice. So was it like, um, working with the team? Are they like the superhumans everybody assumes that they are? I think they're fantastic. Mishko is funny. Yeah, they're, they're great people. That's, that's for sure. Like, I remember the first times, uh, once talk, talk with Igor at NGConf, I was, I was afraid, I was like, that he's so important. But mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I spent the whole internship with him as my supervisor. And I mean, the regular human, just they do awesome work. And they're building a superhero, right? Angular. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And, and I was excited that someone else uses Dvorak. <laughs> Who else uses Dvorak? Mishko. Oh, really? Yeah. Don't his fingers get tangled up? Apparently not. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So kind of walk us through what the experience is like. You apply, you get accepted, and then Google helps you move out to Mountain View, and then do you just basically show up to work? Is that kind of the feel that's there for that, or is there something else that happens? Um, the interns, their first week, you do a lot of intern stuff and intern classes and orientation, but other than that, it's pretty much work at the office. You start off by fixing some small bugs to get to know the code, or I guess in Roddy's case, you already knew the code, so he could just get straight to work. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're considered as Google interns, so we had to learn about the internal infrastructure and so on, even though, like, for me, everything I did was on GitHub and we never touched the actual code base of Google. So you, we were in total about 900 interns, I believe. So the, they already have stuff set up for all interns. It just happened that our project is open source. I thought it was many more interns than that. Oh, I, I thought it was on 900 in, Mount, in the Bay Area. Maybe it's more. Oh, uh, okay. So usually you have your first week of your orientation in Google, and then afterwards, yeah, you work. You just come to the office with your laptop and work. And you have all the free food and perks from Google. Hmm. That's pretty cool. So I hear that uh, it's possible to like practically just live on campus because Google has everything for you. Is that true? They don't have a bed. <laughs> <laughs> what about those little like pod things that you like pull over and you kind of lay down? The nap pods? Yeah. They're good for naps, not for sleeping. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's a lot of sofas and a lot of beanbags. Like I remember in the last week, I Antig was sleeping on the beanbag during work. Mm-hmm. Personally, I, I did spend more than one night at Google. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not recommended. And I, the first time I did it was in San Francisco because I missed the last train back mm-hmm. to, to Mountain View. 
And so I had to go somewhere and I went to the San Francisco office. So it's not recommended, but I mean, there's showers, there's food. What else do you need? Internet. Yeah, you have all the, all your basic needs. Right. <laughs> what was the uh, work schedule like on the Angular team? Was it like really crazy? Were you putting in lots of hours? Was it the opposite? Was there some crazy times where you're doing tons of stuff and sometimes when it's slow? Uh, a lot of people had kids, so people didn't really stay too late, so it was fairly normal hours. No death marches? Nope. Yeah, the hours were flexible. I mean, it's Google. So, uh, but personally, for example, I had some, I remember I had sometimes had meetings in the morning, so somebody's expecting you there in the morning, so you'd have to go early. Yeah, the day does start earlier than a lot of other teams and companies, I would say. Hmm. Plus, if you want to grab breakfast at work, then you have to come in early. But usually people are out of there by like five, though. Gotcha. That's kind of surprising. Well, sp- uh, since I, I spent a like, couple of nights there, I did see people there at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, so it really depends on the project. And so for Angular, we didn't have any deadlines set from somebody else other than us. So if you wanted to, it was pretty... It, it, we didn't have any big pressure, external pressure. All the pressure was internal. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I didn't really feel any uh, any issues with the work schedule and so on. So what's the actual, like, Google office like? Is there a bunch of slides and ping pong tables <laughs> and <laughs> wiffle bats and drones to fly around? What's, what's the physical atmosphere like? It's very open. I had two Nerf guns. I feel that was a must. That, that helped a lot. <laughs> I mean, there were Nerf gun battles inside the office that would happen. Fairly often, actually. <laughs> uh, like, we had arcades, places to sit, meeting rooms named after awesome stuff. It, it's a, it feels, it's very open. There's no, nothing. I mean, you could ask somebody and you probably have another beanbag or so on. Hmm. How did they decide what you were going to work on or what you were going to contribute to in the Angular space? Well, that, that came to your supervisor. So each intern has his, her, his supervisor or her supervisor. And, uh, it depends on what you want to work on, what they want you to work on. And at the end, you get evaluated on your work. So it should be something you like and something your supervisor could help you with. Yeah, there's one-on-one meetings where you can discuss what you want to work on. Gotcha. Uh, so also, that's something that's nice. Since the team is in Google, there was a lot of activities for Google, so we could attend them. Uh, a lot of uh, presentations from executives at Google and so on. And st- also stuff like yoga classes or uh, dancing classes or yo-yo classes. I went to that. That was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> yo-yo classes, wow. Yes. Well, this one, one Googler did that once and invited whoever wanted to show up. Huh. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. For each of you, what was your like favorite experience of your internship? For me, it's probably that now my favorite number is in the Angular code base. <laughs> And uh, now any person using Angular have my favorite number on their HTML elements. <laughs> that, and th- that happened because I was a release master. Uh, I, f- I forgot which version. And so we, we released and we changed some stuff for performance and it created the name conflict. And so we had to, to decide for a unique name. And so I just appended my favorite number to the variable. What was it? What was it was, the number? Oh, 339. Oh, okay, because I put 42 in the code somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I remember somebody opening an issue Y339, and I just closed it saying it's my favorite number. So that's it. <laughs> that's Why awesome. is it your favorite number? Uh, because when I was young, I used to breakdance. And in my first breakdance competition, that was my participant number. So I had that oh, I on me. You. And ever since then, it's stuck on. Really? That's awesome. So, are you a big fan of the movie Breakin'? No, I don't know that. Oh, you've got to see the movie Breakin'. It's from the 80s when, you know, breakdancing was invented. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, start, I stopped breakdancing when I was 11 or so, so mm. it was a long time ago. Right. That's awesome. Anting, did you have your chance to go? Um, I think it was when we finally get, like, all the code merged into the... Uh, actual branch and get it deployed, that's pretty a pretty good experience. Especially oh, yeah? since uh 
it's actually really hard to get code deployed because oh, there's so many other teams that depend on your code that since we were like doing breaking changes and changing the API, it was pretty hard to get everyone onto the new version. Since right. Scudo actually doesn't do versioning and everyone has to use the same version. Hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty crazy. In Google, as Antic said, there's no versioning. So whenever we do an update in Angular, all the Google applications that you use Angular uh, actually get the new version. So oh, wow. they're always on head if you want. Really? And so one consequence of that is whenever we do a new release, we merge it into the code base. But before completing that, we actually run the tests of all the application that use Angular with a new Angular version and check if any of them break. So for <laughs> Angular JS, not only do we run our 4,000 tests or so, we also run all the tests of all of the Google applications that use Angular. Hmm. So was there ever a time when somebody really royally messed something up and everything broke everywhere? It sounds like you're pretty careful. I'm just curious. Yeah, so uh, for example, my, when I my favorite number got into code base, it was because we broke one application that used the same variable name in the global scope. <laughs> so usually we see the test results and if they're red we investigate so Google has their internal tools to avoid that hmm. it makes the, uh, the framework more robust so I like it Aaron you got a question for the uh, interns yeah so I was uh, interested when I heard about the Angular Lint project and I know that Brian told us that it was kind of an intern project thing did you guys get a chance to work on that and if you did, or do you know where the, what's the status of it? It was the two other interns that worked on it. <laughs> okay. That's what I tell my clients when something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's totally two other guys. <laughs> it was the other guys. I personally didn't touch Angular Hint, though I did see their presentation every time they had progress. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about it? I know it, it, the goal of it was to do stuff like prevent you from warning you when you touch the DOM in your controllers. Oh man, I didn't, I should have listened more to the presentation. I think there's just like those warnings when you aren't following like best practices for Angular or something. Okay. Like I remember they had to mock a ton of stuff like compiler and so on just to intercept the calls and make sure that what you're doing follows best practices. It's so really like, useful though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds yeah. super useful. Oh, they did also stuff like typos for directives. So if you have a typo in your HTML, they actually tell you, hey, this, you, this attribute actually you might have put the typo in that attribute, and so on. Hmm. If they were here, they would talk a lot more about it. Well, that was a bad question then. <laughs> so are you guys both still interns, or is, are you done, or, or still interning there, or moved um, on? I'm done. It's just one summer, and I don't think they do internships during the school year, and you have to work at the office anyway, so it's not really feasible. Okay. Yeah, internships at Google are usually 12 to 14 weeks. Okay. And, like, there's a whole evaluation stuff and so on. And actually, if you did a good internship, uh, you can come for another one next summer. So are you guys both heading back next summer? I started becoming a contractor for the team, working part-time as I study. Oh, cool. And switching from contractor to intern, and then back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, if a company had, like, special needs, they would contact the Angular team, and then the Angular team would send it to you as a contractor? No, I work oh. for the team just remotely. Oh, so I was like, you work for Google as a contractor, gotcha. Yes, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I'm just doing it part-time, working on some tools. If I ever got a check from Google that was for more than, like, five bucks, I'd frame it. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? I don't think I ever got a paper check, unfortunately. Oh, I guess that's probably Aww. true. Yeah. Ooh, now we're going to create some check envy because some of them probably get checks. <laughs> so did you have any exposure to Larry or Sergey or any of the folks higher up in the company people actually would have heard of? Yeah, uh, so I, every week there's a TGIF where it's actually Larry and Sergey that host it. And there's presentation related to new stuff in Google and the interns have access to it. So pretty much every week we could see them. I once Larry. opened the door for Sergey. So that's something. Oh, there you and go. The, and Larry almost tripped over my backpack once. Dude, that would have been a nice claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're definitely reachable. I know some interns friends who asked them for coffee and they accepted. Oh, cool. I also heard they say no to selfies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and now we get all the Google lore. I love it. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. Well, I think we're getting close to our time limit, but are there things that people just don't know about or think about in the context of Google and Angular, either about the team or the company? One thing I would say is, like, I remember when 2.0 got announced and so on, people often talked about Angular as in it was Google making the decisions. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, Google's aban- well, abandoning 1.x, but we're not. I mean, uh, 1.4 is in beta and we plan on 1.5, I believe. But really, it's just the team. And most of the team are people from the open source community that joined the team after they've done good work. So it's really not Google people, in quotes, that make the decisions. If you want. I mean, it's a community and we have over a thousand contributors on GitHub. And so it's really the team that does the decisions. Like, people think it's Google, but it's, I mean, we are in Google, but we're still separate in a way. Right. That makes sense. You mean it's not Larry, or it's not uh, Sergey up there making those decisions? No, no. Like, they also a big part of the team are outside of Google. So I think it's a little weird, and, and I don't know how much you guys were exposed to it at Google, but it's weird to me that, like, so many geniuses at Google, on the front end side, there's, like, a bunch of guys that all pretend like the Angular team doesn't exist. And it's weird to kind of see Angular be so successful and Polymer not be, but yet the Polymer guys pretend like Angular doesn't exist. And it's weird to not see the two teams sync up more and get a little bit more on the same page. We, Did you well, guys ever have any, like, weirdness around that when you were there? I remember I was in a meeting. Well, we do have meetings between the Angular team and the Polymer team and talk about the challenges and so on. It was just we had different visions. Like, they, the Polymer is more on the forefront of web components and so on. And just Angular is just being used by clients that can't afford that. We do definitely sync up. We do talk and everything. It's just the two different frameworks, if you want. I don't know if Polymer is a framework. Yeah. But no, there, there's definitely collaboration. It's just not on code level, more on thoughts level. Yeah, like I've never actually worked with anyone from Polymer Dart, but at meetings they have talked about how we want to like play nicer with the uh, Polymer people. Hmm. Yeah, that's always been interesting to me. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it's just uh, Polymer, like I remember it was framed as a research project. So uh, it's, it's two different goals. They don't aim at the same thing, I would. I feel. That's just my personal opinion. Cool. Well, I'm going to push us into picks. Joe, do you want to start us with picks? Sure, I can do that. So my pick today is going to be Kent Beck. For some reason, I was like, looking around on LinkedIn, I'd accepted like a LinkedIn request, and it came up with like, uh, you know, all those suggestions of people you should connect to, and all of a sudden, there's Kent Beck. And so, if you don't happen to know who Kent Beck is listening to this podcast, I feel that that's very sad because Kent Beck is one of the pioneers and luminaries of our industry. He invented extreme programming and test-driven development. He was one of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto. He's currently this like fellowship engineer over at Facebook where his job is to like teach all the senior engineers how to really code. So just an awesome, awesome guy, an amazing guy who's done so many amazing things for our industry. So I just felt like, hey, I'm going to connect and send a connect request and just see. And lo and behold, he accepted it, which I thought was pretty cool. So, you know, I kind of got a little jolt of uh, excitement that I got connected to Kent Beck, one of my idols, you know, as a developer. So I'm going to pick Kent Beck. If you happen to not know who Kent Beck is, I highly recommend you do a little bit of Googling and check out some of his work. His book, uh, Test Driven Development by Example, was how I learned to do test driven development. Very cool. That's my pick. Related plug, we actually had Kent on the Ruby Rogues podcast talking about small talk best practice patterns, which is a book I recommend to all kinds of people who are doing anything with programming and object orientation. Um, And the reason is, is because it basically gives you a bunch of simple patterns you can use to do just massively powerful things with anything that even looks like object-oriented code. So he has definitely pioneered a lot of different areas. Aaron, do you have some picks for Yo, us? Yo, I'm going to pick an event coming up in, in Silicon Valley. It's called Angular U, and it sounds like it's going to get pretty big. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are going to want to speak at an Angular event, and Angular U right now has their call for papers open. And so I'm going to pick that just so that everyone can get their papers in. 
And then there's also another event, an annular event coming to Vegas that people should keep their ears open for. And uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has any more information on that, but I'm going to just pick those those new annular events that are popping up. It's kind of exciting. Isn't the uh, date for that Vegas event set? I think that the date could be announced. Yeah, I think so. The, 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 the Vegas event is on the May 6th seven. and 7th and 8th of May. But yeah, I don't know if there's much more details to announce right now. Awesome. I'm just going to go ahead and pick sleep. Um, the last two nights have been pretty uh, rough. <laughs> Why is that funny? That's pretty funny. It's a solid pick, bro. It's a solid yeah. pick. Who was it that picked uh, Air on one of our previous podcasts? I think that was me, actually. Oh, could be. Anyway, yeah, um, so I've been putting up JS Remote Comp this week, and so I had a few infrastructure things to take care of Monday night. And then I was helping speakers get everything squared away with the system we're using for it last night and then uploading videos so that attendees could re-watch. So uh, anyway, I'm pretty tired. I'm running on uh, potato chips and Mountain Dew. Uh, but uh, Solid fuel, though. That's good fuel. Yeah. But yeah, I'll survive. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where I'm living right now. So uh, Roderick, what are your picks? I want to pick Echo Strip 7. I, re- I worked on Ecclesiastes like, six, the tracer, while I was in my internship, and there's this great video from Jafar Hussein uh, called "The Evolution of JavaScript uh, Version 7. and he talks about async functions and async generators and so on. And so maybe maybe you can watch that and then go to sleep, your head filled with amazing stuff that will come. So yeah, my pick is is this talk. It's actually from the Netflix UI engineering. Yeah, Ecclesiastes. What's it called six. again? Version seven: The Evolution of JavaScript from awesome. Jafar Hussein. And Anting, what are your picks? I think I'll pick the Code Doll Stack Exchange. I go on there quite a bit, and there's lots of like cool programming challenges in Code Doll, wherein people solve them, and it's cool to learn like new algorithms, and sometimes you kind of learn little quirks about languages that you never knew existed. And people also post pretty funny answers, and it's fairly entertaining. Awesome. Well, thanks you guys for coming and talking to us about interning on the Angular team. It was great to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. We'll look forward Thanks, to chance. to seeing... Oh, I forgot to ask. Are there any announcements about NGConf you guys want to put out there? Not really. We're getting so close that there's not too much to announce. We're going to be doing some teasers over the next few weeks, but one teaser is that we're going to have some amazing stickering going on at the conference, so you're going to be excited when you get to the event. Cool. Well, if you're going to be there, yeah. have a look around for all of the folks that are on this show because i'm pretty sure that everybody who's a regular host on the show is going to be there so uh yeah i think that you're right i think you're right so anyway well thanks for coming guys uh we're gonna wrap up the show and we'll catch you all next week this episode is sponsored by mad glory you've been building software for a long time and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming work piles up hiring sucks and it's hard to get projects out the door check out mad glory They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit cachefly.com to learn more. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular.com slash forum and sign up today.